hello, I am not the Aaron you're usually hearing on this channel. My name is Aaron King, and I'm really happy to be here uh, interviewing Aaron Voigt, showrunner, uh, about the upcoming game slash novel co-release, Detente for the Ravenous. Is that how you say it? I'm going to say it five times different ways and everyone is going to be wrong yes uh, so firstly thank you so much Aaron, for agreeing to to interview me um you know I, i've loved your games and, and covered them on the channel before but this is really exciting uh to have you talk to me about my game and uh yeah i chose maybe one of the worst uh titles for <laughs> a game which is to say a french word that has a lot of different meanings that nobody knows uh, but yes detente for the ravenous is what i'm calling it um and you crushed it thank you i mean it's a great We'll get into it, but given uh, the the eras that you're drawing from, like it's a great word to use. It's just the classic reader's vocabulary. Vo- oh my god, <laughs> kicking it off strong. Reader's vocabulary of of seeing the word all the time. Right. And I also have never taken any French classes. It's probably my weakest language. So I'm going to ruin it all up and down this show. Um, do you want to give? Please give a general description of both of these books yeah so the novel started i started writing it in 2022 um as just like a way to you know basically as a thought experiment like what if all the countries that the united states uh, screwed over um were able to like you know tried to take revenge uh, on the united states um and then i was like well that's an interesting premise but what if we added catholicism as i want to do uh and then also added like big monster kaiju uh and that that's how we get to um you know the premise of of the novel the taunt for the ravenous which is like what if a group of people teamed up to go kill pope henry kissinger (laughs) yeah it's a great heady mix and something i think we've all wanted to do right right and you know uh unfortunately he did pass away this year before but yeah, like Rest I in didn't. Piss. Yeah, I didn't quite get this out before uh, he got out, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, I guess it is. Uh, we are also recording this uh, one day after a high-profile assassination attempt. Yeah. So, like, it is it is weird, you know. I guess I'm glad that um, you know uh, Henry's beefed it, so that way I can I can release a game with his picture in it and not get too much flack. <laughs> but like, right. um, yeah, you know, it's 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 an interesting. I, th- I think it's an interesting concept. So the novel came first. Yes, the, the that's the thing. the The whole game is a marketing scheme <laughs> for the novel. Um, I don't I don't know how much you you know about like what I've tried to do creatively, but you know, I, I consider myself a, a tabletop person second for for a long time, just because I I'd been trying to you know do novel stuff. I'm trying to get like you know trad published since like 2017. Um, so yeah, like I, I had written a couple novels, and and Detente was the um, you know, technically the third, it depends on how many times you count, how many times I've revised it, but like, you know, third or or fourth book maybe that I've written. Um, And it's like, you know, it ended up, you know, not being able to go through um, trad publishing. So I was like, well, I I still am pretty, you know, excited about this story. I think it's fun. And and I wanted to to try to get that uh, out there by by self-publishing. And I was like, well, I do have this this platform on YouTube, um, and you know I know a bunch of people in the tabletop scene. So what if I just try to uh, make a short game based off of the novel and use that as like kind of my gateway? Um, and then the game uh, ended up being fifty thousand words long. I was going to say a <laughs> short game. I'm looking at a hundred and forty two page PDF right now. Uh, yeah, I wish it hadn't gotten that long. I just sort of went. <laughs> you know how it is. Yeah, I mean I don't think it's too long. I think. Um, Listen, I've listened to <laughs> RTFM. I know how y'all feel about well, games that are too long. That's why I was like, hmm. <laughs> I wanted to put RTFM in the uh, inspiration section, but I was like, I don't think Max would approve. Oh, well, no. I think 150 <laughs> pages is like a great length for what would be called like a full game or a trad game or whatever. Right. Um, and it's when you get to the 300 page mark that I get mad. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so M. John Harrison said, never publish your first three novels so mm-hmm. i think you're on track i think this is yeah. this is going to be the the right choice um i think since we're talking on your youtube channel which is uh often an audience of game people it might be worthwhile to start with like why is book publishing novel publishing different from 
games. You'd mentioned like you tried and you couldn't do it. Um, my understanding is that if you want to publish a novel, either you're publishing it as like an EPUB somewhere, self-publishing, which has a whole different reputation in mm-hmm. the book world. I'm going to say book many times. It's wrong, mm-hmm. but you know what I mean. It's fine. Uh, versus the RPG world. And then to get something published in a, a big publishing house, you need an agent. You often need connections made through like an MFA program. Um, it's a lot of work. Does that yeah. seem accurate? Like, do we want to give a summary of what that process yeah. often looks like? Absolutely. So um, when you are trying to get something traditionally published, um, like like a novel per se, um, what you have to do is first you you write it, you know, you, you get the, the word doc written up, you polish it as best as you can, and then you start a process which is called querying, which is basically you make a list of literary agents, which are people who are, are you know, gatekeepers. Ge- Gatekeepers are like middle middle persons who will connect you to editors and publishing houses and you know people that have connections in the industry. Um, that their job is to find and make connections in the industry and then um, you know convince those those like you know editors to take on your book um, and then they get a cut as, as part of that. Um, so you know aspiring authors. Um, uh, will query agents basically writing uh, first like a, a letter and then sending them maybe one to three chapters of their book and being like, hey, uh, pretty, pretty, please um, take a look at my work. I, I worked really hard on it and I think um, it's a good book. And then the agents will um, you know, look through all the people who have sent them those letters. Um, they will sometimes ask for a full um, you know, copy of your novel if they really like it. And from there, you know, if they like it, they will go ahead and try to sell it um, to you know, publishing houses or, or um, you know, imprints. And, um, you know, I did that process, right? I briefly had an agent, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, she decided that my books were probably not the best for her. And, you know, um, you know, I, it's, that's just business. That's how it works. You know, it feels bad, but Hey, that's, that's, them's the breaks. Right. Um, but like, you know, that process is really soul crushing. (laughs) Um, you know, I, I, I've made a lot of friends in the writing scene over the years, uh, and like watching people who have really interesting and, and cool novels, um, go through that process of trying to get trad puffed, even the first, um, hurdle, of trying to get an agent, right? You, you hear people talking about how they will send out 200, you know, query letters, right? Um, and get no response back or very little response back, right? Because at the end of the day, um, agents are, are also fielding, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of, of letters from aspiring authors, right? Just because it's, it's easier to become, you know, an author than ever, or it's easier, it's easier to write a book than ever before, right? Um, but because there's a lot of people, you know, there's a lot more, uh, you know, the publishing industry, you know, requires these gatekeepers to kind of um, funnel what they, you know, consider to be the best talent um, into into their, you know, into a manageable number, essentially. And like, um, I think that really stinks, <laughs> um, you know, because the like just so many people are, are writing such interesting stuff. And, you know, that the thing that really bums me out is like, even when you get an agent, there's still no guarantee that that person will be able to sell your book. Um, and that that's what really bums me out is is like you can have a book that's considered, you know, you know, that you were selected from like a, a very small pool of people to as like somebody who's like a good writer. And even then, um, it might not be enough. And, and that's kind of why I wanted to go the self-publishing route, which, you know, um, in, in the book industry, you know, that's kind of like, well, uh, it's certainly less prestigious, right? You don't get paid nearly as much. You're not going to get in advance. Um, but like, also, it's just kind of like, oh, you're you're not you're not trying to do the the horrible um, thing of uh, going through trad publishing, which like, you know, uh, I I think that most people who are who are trying to get trad published aren't going to look down on self published people. But there is certainly that like, it's not nearly as prestigious, right? Yeah. Have you, Aaron? Have you ever tried to to get? trad published uh, in any way <laughs> well i want to get back to that first I, I want to say too like an aspect i've worked at bookstores for years okay. um and so i see i have been part of like the pr machine of publishers and in its best case the idea of agents and editors uh there's this idea of like well we're publishing the big books that get a lot of money and we can then use that money to underwrite maybe more experimental or marginalized works or works that we think is are important but don't 
necessarily have a wide audience um, or that we could see being popular in the future but aren't right now, um, that is the best case scenario. That is not the scenario that's happening right now. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of publishing houses are being bought up by bigger and bigger companies and they are doing that thing that so many American companies are doing of like we have to maximize profits in this quarter right Mm -hmm. now, Um, which I remember first seeing – during the Harry Potter craze of like, um, oh, yeah. Harry Potter is so popular. They didn't need to advertise any new Harry Potter book, but they put right. so much advertising work behind every Harry Potter book and then looked for 10 new authors that are writing books like Harry Potter. Right. Uh, I mean, that's how we get the YA boom in <laughs> right. like the 2010s, right? That's how we get Hunger Games and Divergent, etc. And so my brain goes, oh, Harry Potter got popular because it was like, kind of different we hadn't seen anything like that wouldn't it be nice to take the harry potter money and find other authors that are doing something new and different um yeah but no that's not how these companies work that's not how they can make their predictions that get them funded etc etc um and so it's a system that is feeding people uh, at the top and is not necessarily on the lookout for good art new arts uh things that are boundary pushing or things that are unexpected. Uh, it's often just trying to produce more of the same, which is a bummer. And I know there are editors and agents out there who would like to work against that and who maybe are working against that. Right. But the majority of the industry, I don't think is interested in that sort of thing. Um, right. but no, I have not tried to get published. Uh, I've never, I'm sure I've submitted short stories to places, you know, 20 years ago or whatever, and they were really bad, and I'm so glad they didn't get published. (laughs) But I've never uh, queried an agent. I've never uh, interacted with a a publisher or an editor at a big company. So, And I'm thankful for that. (laughs) I have a lot of sympathy for people that have to do that. Yeah, listen, that's another thing is that just like uh, the – the publishing industry, even once you you make it, um, it is still like a soul crushing. Like, okay, you know, well, taxes are going to take thirty percent of your advance, and then also you're going to, you know, get your the, your payment for your book like doled out to you in like weird chunks over the course of like, uh, you know, three years or whatever. Um, so even like even if you are at the top, it's still weird. Um, so yeah, publishing. You know, I I don't blame anybody who is trying to get published. Um, or, 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 you know, wants to, to pursue that dream, but it, it does seem like a nightmare, Mm -hmm. uh, even, even when you've quote unquote made it. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I, the reason I ask Aaron is because like you, you know, I, you, you pretty regularly post the books that you read on, on the internet, um, on, on your Tumblr, uh, specifically is what I'm thinking of. And like I'm just thinking about how you you like are one of the better writers in in the RPG <laughs> scene, you. Uh, you know, uh, not 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 to like flatter you, but you know I think that's just broadly it's too true. Late. Um, I'm flattered. Uh, well, sorry. Um, and I, you know, it, I think that comes from your your you know certainly reading constantly. And I don't, I don't know if you have any thoughts on like what constitutes good good writing. Um, but that's just something I thought up, you know, because like you, you're a pretty, you know, a pretty darn good game writer. And I'm wondering if like you have any thoughts on how games writing is different than, you know, um, whatever, uh, you know, non game writing that you've done. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts. I think (laughs) I haven't written them down, but I'm sure we can talk about this. I do want to get back to your project and your novel and your game, but I think maybe this is the way to it. Um, I mean, like, instinct, immediate response is games writing has to leave a lot more room for not just the readers, but the people that will play it eventually. Mm -hmm. Um, But a lot of my favorite prose writing and most poetic writing, even if it's not great, still has this huge intention to leave narrative gaps, uh, Mm -hmm. to invite a reader in. Um, And I'm thinking of, like, literary fiction where you maybe see what someone is doing, but you're not told what they're feeling and you have to kind of make those jumps yourself. Um, But also even like the best kind of pulp or action writing or genre writing, um, the trick is always to make the reader think they've figured out the twist. Mm. Even though you're eventually going to tell them, like one of the best feelings in watching a shitty movie is going... I bet they're going to do this. And then they do it. But one of the reasons 
a viewer is able to say, I bet they're going to do that, is because the people that have created this this piece of fiction have put those seeds out there and give right. you little flags and told right. you, like, here's what we're going to do, um, and kind of doling that stuff out, um, knowing when to reveal information um, and when to hold it back, I think is a very key factor for most prose and poetry writers. Uh, maybe that's the key difference, is that as a game writer, you probably shouldn't be holding anything back. Um, I, th I have seen people say like, well, I want the people reading my game to feel this way about this thing or to connect these dots. How can I do that? And the answer is often just say in first person, I'm hoping you feel this. <laughs> or, <laughs> I'm hoping you connect to this. If you want to think more about this, connect to this thing. Like it's technical writing. Um, right. And you can write in the first person, which is generally a pretty big sin in a lot mm -hmm. of more uh, fictional writing. Um, and you can tell people your goal. <laughs> it's almost like giving a TED Talk or whatever as right. well. Um, and so I think there are ways to do that well and there are ways to do that poorly. But that is maybe my key difference is you are inviting someone to come along on a process with you in games writing and you can give them little reminders uh, yeah, I don't know. Does that make sense? You, you've done the thing. You've written 150 pages of game, 300 pages of novel. Like, what is the difference? We, we should also say, like, they're set in the same world. Right, right. Um, the game is, oh my god, what's the heart system called? Uh, the resistance system. The resistance system. So the game uses the resistance system, familiar from Heart and Spire, from... Grant Howitt recently uh, also an assassination attempt on Grant Howitt. Just yes, I media. saw this. <laughs> R.I.P. Grant Howitt. Uh, God rest his soul. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you went through this process of a prose-based story which has themes um, and has a point of view and then a game which intends to give people the tools to tell their own story with their own point of view like what's the difference what was there anything that you could just copy paste over was there anything that you struggled converting yeah um you know i think you know you you gave a very good um explanation of like the importance of leaving gaps um in prose writing uh and like I'm not sure that I successfully did that when I when I converted the novel into a game because a lot of the game was just like, well, I have all this world building junk <laughs> lying around. Lore, the biggest <laughs> yeah. sin. Yeah, listen, I'm I'm currently working on a, an essay about Wonder Homes uh, lore, yes. right? And that's all like very implied, and like you know, there's maybe like you know four or five like capital letter, you know, you know, big nouns. Uh, in the whole game and like you kind of have to piece that together and that's very fun uh and this was like uh gosh i i posted about this on tumblr because i was like i know that everybody is like uh it's it's so it's so passe to um you know put pages of pages of lore in your book however <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> um and, and the reason i did that is just because like you know first when i was like all right i want to i want to make a game of of this as my marketing scheme i looked at um i looked at a couple systems but i i think that spire um worked best because it was like you know it's it's a very similar like oh you're going up against a big uh empire uh and you're gonna get like hurt in a bunch of weird ways um so that worked really well and a lot of what spire and heart do is they have their mechanics at the front of the book and then at the back of the book they're just like well here's a bunch of shit um that you can kind of you know um take apart and look look around with and you know ideally use in your games and i was like well that's that's kind of what my lore is um yeah it's sort of then, like a romantic relationship in that way you lead with here's who you can be and then you mm -hmm. end with here's a bunch of weird shit <laughs> if you want to go through it sorry yeah no ideally that that's how your romantic <laughs> relationships uh, end up um but yeah um so that's that's kind of what what I thought I I was doing, um, and then yeah you know I I don't know I just I wanted to to be like okay there's a lot of stuff in the world that you just don't see through the book, um, you only get like a very small glimpse 
of of like the the main islands and like the the political situation um and then what what i tried to do is like okay the book has a point of view character right it's one person who's like going on her emotional arc to be like ah actually i think fantasy catholicism is bad for me right she Uh, starts as as part of the system um mm -hmm. is maybe even sort of uplifted or privileged by this system right and then starts to see how that system hurts people uh it's like a great arc it's a classic arc i think there's uh as we enter into more radical spaces um it's very easy to kind of forget those steps that got us there Mm -hmm. and it's very easy to forget like oh there was a time where i didn't hate the cops right and then when someone comes to me being like why are cops bad i'm at where i'm at now shouting about how cops are terrible but actually maybe the correct action is to go oh let me recall my journey and mm-hmm. kind of give you the the first step on it um so i think fiction like that is good i don't know <laughs> i don't have anything super insightful but i just mean that path from someone who privileges from a system into someone that is maybe more actively working against that system with the knowledge that they inherited from it uh, is a cool path to track, and I think you did it well. Thanks. Um, yeah, like I, I hope that you know the the main character's arc, you know, it serves its purpose. I and initially when I wrote the first draft of the novel, um, you know, it, it was a character that's much more based around like me personally, um, and you know my my fall away from Catholicism. So I hope that you know some of that still is able to come through in in a less. Uh, I think I think the main character of the novel, uh, Julia, is much more likable than, than me. <laughs> Uh, I think she's great. Her um, YouTube channel is doing numbers. Yes, uh, 100%. God, Julia's YouTube channel <laughs> would be like one of those, like, uh, it'd be like one of those, like, deconversion, like, uh, deconstruction evangelical. Yes. like, here's my journey uh, about how I left the commune and hooked up with my ex-girlfriend and we <laughs> did blow up a building. Uh, <laughs> it was fine. Top um, 10 tips to blowing up a building. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I have a number of friends who are ex Jehovah's witnesses and, uh, in the past couple of years have discovered the XJW subreddit, right. uh, and just that idea of the journey away, uh, I think is really interesting. And also just as, as, you know, someone who grew up pretty neoliberal, like in the time of Bill Clinton and being like, right. we fixed it all. The wealth is flowing. <laughs> the, mm-hmm. uh, racism is abolished. Um, I think the, I forgot. Yeah, you're you're about ten years older than me, I, so you did get to see the part of American history where we fixed racism, yeah, which was probably pretty cool for you. I'm forty. Well, it was cool for me at the time. I loved it, <laughs> but it did not prepare me to live in our current times. Yeah, uh, I have di- a different skill set suited for a different time, perhaps. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think maybe I just wanted to ask about or talk about like. Christianity, faith, Catholicism in literature, in English language literature, um, maybe where you, I mean, you're ex-Catholic. I was going to say, maybe where you came across it, you came across it in your day-to-day life. Um, but like the the path, the arc of America is not a religious country. Wait, maybe it is. I have an English degree, and that means I read a lot. Of, I literally had to read the Bible in college. Mm -hmm. Um, like where do we talk about Bible boys right now, but like, where does this come (laughs) in? Um, how did it come about for you? Like, was it enjoyable for you to tap into that? And, uh, yeah. Like what, what does Christianity and Catholicism bring to your work? Yeah. I mean, like, I think it, I think a lot of it just comes from like, uh, resentment, uh, which like, you yes. know, if you know any Catholic people, you know, that's like a <laughs> primary driver in their lives. Uh, so listen, you can k- take the, the boy out of the church, but you can't quite take the, the guilt and, and anger out of, out of him. Um, and, and yeah, you know, like I, I was really, really committed to the church for, for, you know, a number of years when I was a, was a teenager. And then like immediately upon graduating from my Catholic high school, I was like, oh, this was all made up. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> um, and you know, that's not to say that people who, who still are in, in the faith are, you know, I think that they're terrible and evil. Right. But like, you know, for me, that was my, my arc. And like, I've spent the last 10 years of my life being like, 
Man, I wish I had not cared so much about that that stuff. I, I think that's made me a weirdo. <laughs> um, I think I have a lot of hangups now that I think perhaps <laughs> I wouldn't have if I had perhaps like been cooler in high school instead of like doing a rosary every night. Um, but yeah, you know, like uh, as as far as like my own you know process through that was just kind of like seeing the ways in which it you know the the ways in which the especially the the American church like is is not conclusive um, you know with with the practices that Catholicism aims to you know espouse right um, you know I, I think a lot of it actually has to do with like the the, the church's stance on queer people um, you know as much as Pope Francis feels like he's you know down enough with queer people to to drop the f slur in italian <laughs> <Jesus>. uh, <laughs> um you know i think the church still has a long way to go uh, yeah. with or with regards to gay rights and you know that was a thing for me where i was like well you know i'm a biracial person like the, the church famously was pretty pro integration uh, as far as like integrated marriages go for for a long time but like couldn't get there with with gay people um and that really bummed me out you know for for a number of years um, and then weirdly, I didn't know that many gay people until, um, you know, long after when I joined the RPG scene and I was like, oh, okay, here's, here's where everyone is. <laughs> All the uh, gays are here. Welcome. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, that was, that was my, like, I couldn't really reconcile those two points and that's how I ended up in this like weird space. And then also, um, for viewers who might not know, I'm like, uh, I guess the, the easiest way to explain this is half Indian. Um, so like. The fact that my mom was Catholic before she met my my dad, who was also Catholic, you know, speaks to, you know, a history of, um, you know, why Catholicism ended up in India. And spoiler alert, it's not great. Uh, right. Like when you're saying like, oh, they were pro like uh, interracial marriage, like a lot of that is because that has been a tool for the spread of Catholicism. Right. Is like, let's convert you and let's, uh, you know, tie you inevitably via your your children to our our process here mm -hmm. um I, yeah wild shit um i yes i agree with you the system is so bad it's so strange people inherit so much trauma from it uh i do find myself frequently enjoying books that create an understanding of the people trapped in that system um I remember I grew up, so my mom's family is Mormon, which is its own mm. can of worms. My dad's yeah, family is Catholic. Yeah, like Catholicism on, you <laughs> right. know, like turbo steroids. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and my dad's family is Catholic, but both of them were kind of had just like soft. They existed on the periphery of that. It was not a big thing. Um, I went to a couple of years of Catholic school as a very young kid, but only because it was the better school in the small town right. I lived in. And my family... Right. We're like, we want to put you through this better school. Um, I never felt any pressure to go to church. I, my family, my parents did not go to church. Um, and I feel very privileged in that. And I remember then going to high school in the Midwest, where a lot of people are different flavors of Lutheran. And mm -hmm. um, my friend was saying like, oh, I can't hang out tonight. I got to do like my confirmation classes. I hate yeah, it. I don't, CCD. <laughs> I don't want to do it, but like, I got to do this. And I was like, well, if you don't want to do it, just don't do it. And she was like, she looked at me like I was a fucking idiot, which I was. <laughs> the idea that she could like buck her family and her whole community that she grew up with and just be like, sorry, I'm out in one action is like insane that I suggested it. And that I was suggesting it from this place of like, it doesn't matter to me. Um, but in that moment I saw like, Oh, you're tied up in this in a way that is not just something you can resolve in a in a single like I'd prefer not to no thank you mm -hmm. um, and so books works that uh, help me understand those points of view and like situate me in that journey I think are personally important because I know a lot of people like I said who have struggled with leaving these systems and it can be a church but it can also be you know, working at a big company that pays your bills and you find out they're not doing things so nicely. And, uh, you know, how do you quit? Especially if you have family, especially if you have kids, especially if you have 
uh, medical bills that need to be paid. Um, mm-hmm. We get so wound up in these systems that both lift us up and then cause the problems that we are trying to pay for. Um, I appreciate that there are stories out there that follow people trying to grapple with that stuff. Well, turns out I'm talking about your book, but I'm unfortunately talking about myself. What Listen, a, what I mean, that's kind of the, the dream of every author, right? <laughs> is for them, somebody to read their book and be like, oh, I see myself in I this. See that's, it. Yeah. that's good. You know, listen, if, if I can reach 30 people that, that have that response, I will be consider myself successful. Yeah. Would you say 30 sickos? I would say 30 sickos. That would, has been yeah. my, my guiding star yeah, throughout this process. you sent me a message that says we should talk about finding your 30 sickos. Uh, do you want to explain that? Do you want to expand on yeah, it? Yeah. So I have, I have like a whole like segment um so this the concept of 30 sickos um comes from at psycho history on uh uh i guess twitter um don't call the, it x we refuse okay yeah <laughs> i'm not gonna call it that uh quote the concept of the mass audience has had a largely deleterious influence on art create art for at most 30 sickos at a time uh and then like um, the reason I saw, you know, this, this is because people were talking about it, obviously, but, um, another thing that came up, um, is I saw this thing on itch.io. It's called good writers are perverts. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, this is awesome. From domino club. About dot to ruin my algorithm right now. <laughs> yeah, I know this will be, this will be great. But like, um, it's basically like a little manifesto about like, you know, creating art. Um, and what domino club writes is that like, um, I think a lot of small indie games have the sort of spot the author's fetish element in that it tends to be A, subject matter, and B, the element of the game that is most comprehensively, lovingly made with everything else in support, a game with bare bones images and music, but with engaging gameplay, a gorgeous UI supported with merely functional plot and mechanics, intricate, mysterious world building with stolen music and plain art, uh, basically a concluding with... I think when writers are afraid to be perverts that they make bad work, they make the work that can't stand by itself collapsing on interrogation or challenge, or too many contrasting and unconfident voices have averaged out to a sort of perversion of the commons, indulging only the safest and most unoffensive fetishes to render on the screen. This um, rules. This yeah, is no, so I'll, I'll send you. I'll send you the link afterwards because the whole thing is worth reading. Um, but like, that's kind of a thing that I have like been thinking about, which is like. I don't think that there are, you know, you know, I don't think that the top for the ravenous is going to appeal to a million people. Right. You know, I've, I've sent you, I think I'm trying to be very transparent with the fact that like I suck at layout. Um, and I'm, I'm commissioning I'm also bad at layout. We've talked about that. Yes. No, I famously make famously to me made, an, <laughs> made a video essay about why your inability to uh, do layout has made me feel better about that. <laughs> um, but like, um, yeah, like I, I, I'm being pretty transparent with saying, like, at eh, the arts, like all you know, public domain or creative comrades, um, you know, and it's kind of just kind of slapped in there, right? I, I'm not good at layout. Um, I, I'm not very good at you know photo editing. I'm trying to get a cohesive, um, you know, vibe going, but like it's not going to be to the same pro- professional degree that like you know, you know, shout outs to everybody else in the indie scene, you know, who are who are making really good looking games. You fucking but that's just perverts. Not me. <laughs> you yeah. layout perverts. Yeah, you fucking layout weirdos. Um, like, listen, um, that's not me, right? I, I'm a weirdo about Catholicism, clearly. <laughs> um, the, you know, um, and and I guess also the 17th century forms of warfare. <laughs> well, um, I, I do want to say also, like, no one says this novel layout was bad. I just read the new translation of Halder Loxness, and the layout was bad. <laughs> um, and I think that just... I don't know what it is that separates I, – I love prose. I trust in prose. I trust that right. someone who likes to write can, in an RPG, write prose that does the work of uh, a beautiful illustration. I love illustrations. Like I came up on comic books. I love art. I wish – I've struggled. I've tried so hard to be an artist. Right. The time it takes – is way too much than I can ever do. But the idea that uh, uh, an RPG has to be visually appealing, um, I love a visually appealing RPG, but I do like to just push back on that when I have a chance and just say, like, just give it, you know, if you're on, if you're not reading 300 pages, if you're only reading 
150, 50 pages, like just give me a chance. Give this prose a chance. Not even me specifically, but just like uh, White Hack is a semi-famous OSR game that is no art, Mm -hmm. very textbook layout. Um, The Isle by Luke Gearing. I was going to say Luke Gearing also famously no art. I I get why you wouldn't be interested in that if you're used to very lush art and cool layout. I wish I could do cool layout, but I also think like if you are trying to develop a kind of readerly approach to stuff, like give those books a chance. Like people are trying to be good at RPG pros and people are succeeding out there. And, uh, yeah, I'm not trying to overthrow the Will Yobsts of the world. Like I love Will Yobst. <laughs> I love Torque. Like the layout in that game is amazing. Um, but it is, uh, there, there are certain skill sets and access to people with those skill sets that it speaks to. And there's another option. There is another path, another way. And mm-hmm. so like, let's all be shitty at layout together <laughs> and we will go to zine fest and sell our, our textbook layouts, mm-hmm. our shitty little stapled things. <laughs> yes. Um, we all, we're all going to join hands and jump into this word document together <laughs> and put that up on itch.io. <laughs> I like that. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, like, I guess, I guess, you know, I, I'm thinking about, like, you know, not to say that you're old, but you, you've been in the RPG scene for longer than I I'm have. I'm not young. Right? I mean, I have to accept it. And so an important part of that is that other people should say it to me. I am. I, I do not think 40 years old is old. Um, <laughs> firstly. Um, but like, you know, I just want to say you, you have more experience in the scene than me. I've been, you know, in the scene roughly three years, right? Which is basically no time. Geologically um, speaking. Right. Um, but like, you know, it seems like uh, you, you can probably speak to this, but like th- there has been, a, you know, a, a shift. Uh, it, it seems like games are getting more, you know, professional in that way. Like there, there is this expectation uh, that there is art, that there's going to be very beautiful layout, that there's going to be, um, you know, uh th- things are going to be you know uh, like a- at a certain level of production quality that um you know that i frankly you know don't have the time or skill to to, to produce yeah, do, do you think that's true yeah i mean it's it's there is a question of like well do you want me to make games that look as good as will yelp's games cool i'll release one game every two years and it right. still won't look as good as Will Yopes games. Uh, and I, I don't, I'm not trying to badmouth Will Yopes. Like, truly, no, they are like. I am, but that's different. A leading star for me, someone I respect so much. But it's like, I, I must choose between either releasing a game when it's done, prose wise, or releasing a game when it looks as good as the leaders of layout, which would be every two years or never, more likely never. Right. Um, and it gets back to what you were saying about. Um, like gatekeeping in publishing. Uh, I don't think my game should look as good as a game from a company that pays a staff of 10 people to 20 people with a budget for art. Uh, And I think chasing that, again, I would just never put out a game. Uh, Right. So it's... you know, the more I learn about how much pe- money people make in this scene, the more angry I get because it's like, oh, these people that I thought were previously like, you know, hot shots are like, they like don't have health insurance. Right. It's like, That's OK, the other- then what are we fucking <laughs> doing here? <laughs> I, I would rather pay once a year. I give someone one hundred, three hundred dollars to give me one cool piece of art uh, than to like try to find some unsplash thing where someone like Fiverr or what you know that's often the suggestion mm-hmm. of like you just go on Fiverr and you find all this stuff and I don't want to get into AI no God discussion no. <laughs> we don't right. we do not have time no uh, we don't. Uh, fuck it that's the only thing I'll say but like yeah uh, finding ways to like sustainably create careers and again this gets back to the trad publishing thing of like maybe a hundred years ago you could make a living as an author and release mm-hmm. a book every two to five years and be fine. And now you have to be James Patterson and create a whole weird right. sub economy of paying <laughs> mm-hmm. writers who will not be credited uh, and release three books a year to make a living. 
Uh, yeah. Um, Rebecca Kwong, who is one of my favorite authors and, you know, uh, Babel inspired a lot of the the work in Detente for the Ravenous. Um, you know, when she was publishing her Poppy War trilogy, right, she sold the first book or, you know, the first book got published in 2018. And like, she just like could not stop writing <laughs> until it, the last book got published in 20, I want to say 2021. Uh, maybe 2020, I think is when the third book of that, but like, you know, she was like in college and eventually doing our master's program and like, you know, just like unable to do anything but keep publishing because that's what the strictures of that contract demanded and like that, you know, that blows. <laughs> yeah. And um, so many careers kind of associated with prose writing, like being a professor are now so weird. Like you have to be an adjunct and you're getting paid per class and you like I have a friend who's a published author through Tor no through Daw um and he's like I just want to quit my job as a professor and become a mail carrier because the wow, stress man. of self promotion like if you are a, a a newly entering the field they're not putting any money behind you right you are expected to like have a platform and and go to conventions and be on panels mm-hmm. a lot of which requires paying your own travel costs or paying mm-hmm. your entry fee into those conventions it's uh it's dumb it's bad it's right. not sustainable or healthy no the um, people making money don't care about that but no there um, a lot a lot of uh you know trad pub authors or people who are trying to be trad pub authors will talk about how there is a big expectation to be on tiktok and be constantly oh, making tiktoks God. and it's like writers are the last people on earth who want to be doing fucking dances yeah. on tiktok unfortunately i am ugly i'm saving you by not being on tiktok you're welcome uh can we get back to your work as much as I will talk shit for hours about um, big corporations, um, let's talk about how your RPG is different from Heart Inspire and um, how it slots into the book and the setting of the book, but also just you got some real freaks in here. Uh hopefully let's talk about the fetishes that you've brought to the game <laughs> okay oh yeah no um let me just go to the fetish section um, aka the npcs <laughs> so one thing i like about the resistance system is you start with some cool abilities you can always be a little weird you can always mm-hmm. kind of change some narrative and then you get the major advances which are often like world changing and or world ending things um, mm-hmm. Inspire and Heart, a lot of these are very magical. Uh, you know, you, you right. ignite the new heart of the world and change whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, you are dealing with... A big with- monster comes out from inside of you. Yeah. The, the dog, you got that dog in you, literally. <laughs> <laughs> um, you are dealing with, like, a somewhat more realistic world. Like, this is an espionage game as much as it's an adventure right. game. And right. so you have classes like Agent or Soldier, um, and it's hard... If I were trying to create these things, it would be hard for me to be like, what's a big world-changing thing to being a soldier without saying you become a literal monster that right. shoots everyone with a monster machine gun out mm-hmm. of your wolf mouth or whatever. Um, I thought you did a great job of finding these big advances, these big character abilities that hewed to that espionage fiction without breaking it. Um what was the, here? There's the doctor one, the bioengineer one, where you're like, "I'm really sorry, I'm turning you into a kaiju." Yeah, yeah. That one's um, so <laughs> huge. It's amazing to be like, "Oh, we're just hanging out in this village." Not anymore. Now there's a big monster rampaging. Um, the scale change is awesome. The tragedy is great because it's like if the monster sees you, you're, it's coming after you as well. Right. Uh, you are not excluded from being monster fucked parentheses derogatory mm-hmm. um but just like did you have a hard time coming from these this system that is like very magical and strange and trying to fit it into like fucking born identity i'm a spy <laughs> Uh, yes, 100%. I found it very difficult. <laughs> um, you did a great you know, job. I did like, I don't want to No, make it no, I, I appreciate that, but I'm glad that you, you, you know, bring that up because I, you know, I was basing this off of heart inspire and I'm just like, well, 
uh, you know, there is some like quote unquote magic in this game, right? There's big, there's big monsters. There's, um, you know, there's like weird science, right? That's why the bioengineer exists, right? Um, in, in the game or in the book, right? The novel bioengineers rarely come up at all. Um, because like, you know, they, they, they exist, but like, I didn't really, you know, have, you know, much to say about them because that wasn't the focus. But then in the game, I was like, I really need, I need a way to explain all the magic shit. Uh, and that's how bioengineers ended up getting, you know, really expanded in the, in the game. Um, but yeah, like, like you can tell that the agent is the first class I wrote because the, a lot of those advances are very, um, very scaled back, right? It's just like, oh, people are, you know, even, even the best ones are like, oh, you're like, you know, able to create a false flag operation. Um, but that's, you know, you, that's awesome. It's huge. I, and we haven't gotten into, I mean, another thing I want to get into is the, the nation phase. Um, but the idea of there are these two distinct scales of play you're a person on the ground or these nations are moving against each other. And a lot of these big advances, if you're an agent or if you're a soldier are like, Oh, actually I make a war right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. You thought we were in a dungeon. We're actually in a war. Um, <laughs> and that kind of scale breaking, I think is something a lot of RPGs are afraid to do or don't do well all the time. I see when I'm really depressed, which is every day I go to, reddit.com slash r slash rpg <laughs> yep. and yeah. someone goes how do i do a game where they still do dungeons but also are in charge of a kingdom um and so many games are bad at that they've tried and they failed and you have <laughs> tried and you've succeeded in a kind of terrifying scary way <laughs> of, oh. uh in a you know i mean that as a compliment like no, i'm just i'm very impressed that's a very flattering thing to say it's Thank just you. <laughs> such, it's such a cool thing to be like oh we're sneaking through here and someone caught me I could try to kill them or this is where the war is now. <laughs> and then I run away as like terrifying and so narratively mm -hmm. powerful. Yeah. I, I hoped that, that that would be the case. Right. Um, so it, that, that nation system, the nation turn didn't start in the game. Uh, but I went to um, one of the Aaron Lim session zero, another one of the, uh, the Aaron Aaron's Lim. in the RPG. Aaron Lim, <laughs> I think, is the greatest Aaron that we can all aspire yeah, to. Yeah, it's it's hard. You know, we're, we're both great, but Aaron Lim's on another level. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but like, you know, I went to the session zero discord and I was like, ah, I just trying to figure out how to make factions work in this game. And, you know, I got some feedback from from the smart folks there and they're like, well, uh, you know, how about, um, you know, doing like sort of a um, an armorister thing? Um, you know, I, I listen to Friends of the Table. They they have this they, they've been doing their partisan season, um, you know, a game by, by Briar Sovereign Armorister, which has this like faction level turn. Um, and from there, I, you know, used that and I added a little bit of the, um, I think it's uh, stars without number or worlds without number, um, system like there, that, that Which kind they of, also uh, use for counterweight, the faction. Oh part. yes. Yeah. Yes. I haven't listened to counterweight. I, I'm, you know, for as much as I'm like, oh, Austin Walker's my favorite oh. guy. I've never listened to counterweight. So my, weird, fan. my weird thing is that I went to college with Andrew Lee Swan. Right. And we played D&D right. &D together. And he and Sylvie were the faction turned people in counterweight. And I'm yes. pretty sure they use stars without number. So that's that's really cool. Um, so, you know, like, obviously, Friends of the Table, big influence on me. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's what I'm trying to do is, is like, bring that, like, um, that, that same feeling where it's like, okay, how can we make our, you know, players on the, on the you know, the, 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 the small tactical level you know feel like they impact the big uh, overall level and you know i don't know how well balanced uh the nation turn is frankly i'm sure that'll get updated you know if, if people end up playing it and they're like hey actually um it's impossible to beat uh Kajum because they they are weighted so heavily against you uh i try to give them a lot of bonuses that's so that way a bug. that's a feature like i don't yeah, know i mean ideally yes <laughs> um but yeah, you know, you try trying to make it seem like, you know, if everything's weighted against you, then your your operatives have a big, big impact on that. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm glad that you like that. Um it's it's a it's a neat thing that I hope that people will will get a lot out of. I know that the Heart Inspire games are not really designed for like long form um like campaign play, right? They work best as like a a few shot. You know, like maybe eight sessions max but i hope that by adding this kind of overall system like you might be a little bit more willing to to kill off your operative um in, in service of the greater overall i was just uh, gonna say yeah like in heart inspire you kind of will 
not quite inevitably, but almost certainly die and then have a big effect on the world in dying. Mm -hmm. But adding the, the nation turn, the faction turn, implies like, it's just like a, a beautifully tragic thing of like, well, if I die, they're still the nation turn. Like, I can die and fuck up their finances, and then they have a, a rebellion, and even though I'm dead, I, the player, get to watch this nation turn kind of finally have that big kick. Uh, I, I think that's nice. I think finding a way, a reason to give players a chance to sacrifice their characters is hard. It's a, it's a, you know, a kind of golden goose in a lot of RPGs. Yeah. Um, and I think like getting to these major and critical advances where you might explode yourself, but in return, like destroy the economy of your enemy. <laughs> it's that's really good. That's really, I had also been playing a lot of Victoria three um, before I started writing this game. Have you ever played any of those no, paradox I don't, games? I don't Aaron? know what this is. Uh, Victoria 3 is a grand strategy game that takes place between like 1836 and 1936, I want to say. So like that age of like, you know, Victorian English uh, imperialism. And like I had just gotten so wrapped up in their trading system because like so much of that game is like making sure that your your citizens have enough trade goods and like furniture and like cured meats and shit. <laughs> um, and I was like, you know, obviously I'm not going to get that granular, but I would love uh, to make an RPG where you can destroy the economy. Yeah. And I think one of my, my things in the nation term is like cause a housing crisis. Yes. <laughs> Which the, is fun. The in you know in the past 50 years of rpgs so much of that domain level play has been trying to simulate a reality right. um and i at this point i'm willing to say we designers failed it's stupid a fool's goal to simulate right. <laughs> the full nation's economy whatever whatever mm -hmm. uh and i think just making these huge fucking swings that you have in here and just saying like a person at this level of power uh, can just tank someone's economy or incite the people to revolt. Like that's the way to go. We don't want the day-to-day -day stock market Dow shit. We want to know when someone found that perfect lever to create a people's rebellion. And so, yeah, yeah I'll play your game any day of the week. I'm not going to play all those old verisimilitude, <laughs> whatever games. Yeah, listen, I, I love I love me a paradox game, but I do have to watch like hours of YouTube tutorials <laughs> to figure it out. Right? So like, uh, I hope this is a little bit easier than that. But you know, that's that's kind of the 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 critique of what what's the the term simulationist gameplay, yes. right? Yeah. Which is like, uh, yeah, you know, at a certain point, you're simulating too much, buddy. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I don't want to write letters back to people as the head of a company. I want to be a little <laughs> creep out in the streets who happens to find a way to light everything on fire. That's way more fun. Yeah. Um, we're approaching an hour. Is there anything yeah. we haven't gotten to that we want to get to? I guess probably, you know, to, to, to cap this off, you know, this is all about books and, and writing, you know, Aaron, you've been in this, this, you know, you've been writing for a long time, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I, I made this because like, I, I think I'm a, pretty good writer you know i think i'm not perfect i think i've got a long way to go but i'm at this like intermediate stage of my my writing career um you know wherever that goes who knows but like you know in in your in your time you know learning and, and eventually becoming a very good writer you know have you ever like settled on a definition of you know why why writing what makes writing good or you know <laughs> what what, what do you shit. think makes yeah, you know, just like easy, you know, easy like a like softball to, to segue us yeah. out. You know, what's what's good writing, Aaron, real quick? I, uh, the first time, no, the second time I dropped out of college, I moved to a different town and I was working at an old timey confectionery and ice cream place. And so four to five days a week, I would go in and put on black pants and a nice white shirt and an apron and a paper hat. And I would either be scooping ice cream or washing dishes or helping the owner's dad, an 80-year-old man named Oscar, make homemade chocolates and stuff. 
And so we were on a main floor of a building. We had the ice cream shop. We had a coffee shop. And then we had a basement where we stored all this bulk candy that we ordered from people. And we had the place where Oscar would make, like, these chocolate turtles, like almonds, caramel, chocolate. And one day, Oscar was like, hey, look at this. And he took me to the basement stairs, and he pulled down this, like, plywood slide that he had constructed on a hinge that would cover the right half of the stairs. And he took a big box that we just received and put it at the top of the slide and shoved it down. And he's like, what do you think of that? And I said, well, that saves me a lot of time carrying stuff down the stairs. And he was like, yeah, every day you try to improve a little bit. You try to make this place a little better. And I just like was almost crying because this man that could like, you know, not lift anything was so old uh, was still just like making these weird little changes around here and thinking of other people other than him. And that's one of the things that I just like carry forward in this process of making stuff is just like, I will never be a Will Yobst. I will never be insert name of my favorite writer here. Um, but I'm driven to make these things. There's no reason for me not to make them. I might as well try to get a little better every single day. Uh, and sometimes that means reading. And sometimes that means like sitting down and doing some hard self-assessment and figuring out where the weaknesses are or how to get better or how best to spend my time. Um, sometimes it's fun. Sometimes it's really hard. But, I d you know, I don't – I'm not going to become fucking William Faulkner, you know. I'm not going to become Louise Erdrich. But I shouldn't – that's poison brain to try to, like, become and uh, overcome them or whatever. Um, I think it's just – if this is something I'm going to do no matter what, I would like to get a little bit better at it every single time I practice it. Uh, and so hopefully someone will put that on my gravestone. Try it a little bit every day. Here lies Aaron King. <laughs> That is beautiful. That, <laughs> that is, I think, is ultimately really, really profound and where I want to end up, too, you know? I, there, there is only the work at the end of the day, um, and if you can be happy with the work you put out, you know, I think you'll, you'll die better than most. <laughs> right, and especially, like, all these systems we've discussed don't necessarily care about that work you do unless right. they can make a pretty penny about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so... I, you know, I don't, it's just, it's hard out there and, uh, <laughs> we're trying to share and we're trying to find our 30 sickos and we're trying to turn our trauma and our perversions into something that means something to us and other people. Uh, uh do you want to give like your top five perversions here that you can find in this book as a selling point? Yeah, um, probably <laughs> no, the first the one is uh, yes. self uh, self hatred. Okay. So that's the first one. <laughs> Familiar with that one? Yeah. Um, second one's monster fucking, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, third one is corsets. Uh, fourth oh. one is um, chains, and fifth one is mm, uh, just armor. Steppy, big steppy, big steppy. Yeah. <laughs> If, a, if somebody with an armored uh, shoe could step on me, that would be awesome. <laughs> Please put me in a corset and chains and then have uh, the hottest kaiju mm -hmm. <laughs> stomp on through here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know who's listening here at the end of this, but I did write a kaiju specifically about monster fucking uh, for the Tumblrites out there. So uh, <laughs> check this out. Um, anything else? No, I just I'm just so grateful that you took the time uh, to, you know, interview me uh, about my own my own book it, it it gives me an excuse to go on and on about it's stuff that book. i've had inside my head for two years it's a good book it's a good game uh no shame to grant howitt who i think is doing some big work out there but i will play detente for the ravenous any day before i play heart or spire uh mostly because i want to shamefully turn someone into a giant monster and that that's the promise we make to you here <laughs> um, 
Yeah, thank you so much, Aaron. Um, I don't know who, who else is listening who doesn't know who you are, uh, but if you want to find Aaron's games, you can find them at erinking.itch.io. Uh, Aaron's on Twitter at AaronMFKing um, and at Tumblr at Aaron'sRPGs at Tumblr.com. Don't find me on Twitter. Yeah, I mean, also, don't find me either there, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a bad place, but yeah. we're occasionally there, unfortunately um what's next you got something you're working on right now uh i mean i'm mostly just like kind of finishing up this game i might i don't know i'm hopefully once this is all done going to take a nap and (laughs) that's important this yeah you ever you ever start a project and go ah (laughs) uh, this one was actually bigger than i than i wanted it to be Uh uh-oh you ever finish Uh, a project so big you just have to take after. yes you're instantly forced to go to sleep <laughs> yes that's that is what i'm feeling so uh, hopefully hopefully that'll be my game design for the rest of the year and then maybe sometime next year a bad idea will strike me and i'll spend uh the next six months working on that but and hopefully it's like 600 pages of content that's insane we shouldn't call it content sorry yes but it's, it's not content like, um it does it's, feel it's, nice i don't know if you get this feeling to to walk the path and then look behind you and be like, holy shit, I did all that. Yes. I mean, that's the thing. I hate making videos with every fiber of my being, but I love when a video is done. <laughs> um, and yeah. I, I feel a little bit better about writing. Uh, I enjoy the process of writing more, but man, it feels good to be like, I wrote a book. Yeah, it's done. You might spend some time on it later, but you wrote a book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, goodbyes, goodbyes. Yeah. That's all we got. Uh, to Tom for the Ravenous coming September 24th, hopefully. Yes. Uh, but yeah. Do you, you'll edit in if there's like a place to find it or something. Yeah. Um, probably at, at uh, Aaron SXL.itch.io slash DFTR RPG. Um, but otherwise just, uh, if you're watching this YouTube channel, you probably know where to find me. So.